welcome to Performing Diaspora 2014. Performing Diaspora is a program that comes out of the Harriet Tubman Institute for Research on the Global Migrations of African Peoples, which is far too long, so we call it the Tubman. So Performing Diaspora started six years ago. This is our sixth year, so five years ago. And we take a moment in the year to use performance as our prism through which to view Africa and its diasporas. We focus on performance, we focus on the artists, we focus on the artists, we focus on the culture of Africa and its diasporas. In the past, we have done jazz, we have looked at drumming, we have done other films, we have looked at gospel singing, and today we look at one of the icons of black culture, Bob Marley. Before we turn to the film, I'd just like to issue a particularly warm welcome in this cold weather for the people who have come out this evening. February is a very complicated month for us here in Canada. It has been chosen following in the echo of the United States as Black History Month. And as a result, there are a zillion things going on all at the same time, competing for the few of us who are pausing in this moment to reflect on what it means to be black here in Canada, and in fact, to be a person of African descent wherever we might find ourselves. So this is a thing for us to think about as well, about the ways in which we are all now caught up in this one month, talking about this one subject for this one moment. Maybe it, is a mo maybe it is a time for us to think about blackness beyond the February 28th. So we will talk about this in the top one, I assure you, because we have worked very hard on this program and we know that students are pulled in many directions. There are so many things going on. They have classes. There's this thing and that thing. So maybe we need to have another moment. Uh, to talk about this. But for today, thank you so much for coming out. Y'all don't clear the snow off of the sidewalk. So thank you for slipping and sliding through the nastiness. Y'all don't have no parking for nobody. So thank you for taking the bus and the train and finding parking way, way over yonder and walking through the nastiness. Thank you so much. We are starting an hour late, which means we are on time. And I'd just like to thank our two guests um, who came from far tech plane and come, uh, Esther <laughs> and Gian, who came in for this thing, for this important moment. And I, I want to introduce the people who are going to be part of our conversation. And even one person who doesn't know, he will be part of our conversation. Clive, yes, you may talk in a blue sweater. All right. So, this film has been awarded great accolades. And we need to take a moment and view this film. And we are particularly fortunate that the people who put the film together are here with us to talk about their process and talk about why this film came to be what it was. And I just read from the, the, um, the cover of the film. It went to New York Tribeca. It went to Cannes. It has been given by UNESCO an honor award. And it went to the Edinburgh International Film Festival. It is now making rounds in Toronto. It has been to Jamaica. It has been shown at the University of the West Indies in the reggae unit there. It has been discussed just about everywhere. So I think it is appropriate that here we at York who are so strong and so focused on issues of Africa and its, and its diasporas that we should take this moment to talk about this icon of black culture. So to introduce Esther. Esther Anderson is an NAACP Image Award actress. She is also an award-winning filmmaker, a photographer, a lyricist, and in parenthesis, she is a riot. 
co-founder of Island Records. And for those of you, yes. Hmm. So we need to ask Esther about that. Co-founder of Island Records in the early 60s, Esther contributed greatly to the expansion of the public face of Jamaican music and the emerging film industry. Over the last 40 years, she has been a creative force behind the music career of some of the big names in Jamaican music, Millie Small, yes, my boy, Lollipop, and so on, Jimmy Cliff, um, and others. And Esther is cre credited with assisting in the launch of the international career of Bob Marley and the Whalers, promoting the popular imagery of the union between reggae and Rasta, especially through promoting the iconic images of Bob's first albums. Both as a photographer and artistic director, she was involved at the outset. Esther is credited with important collaborations with Bob Marley and the Whalers in the creation of the music anthems, Get Up, Stand Up, Stand Up For Your Rights, I Shot the Sheriff, and War. As an actress, Esther has worked with Sir John Mills, with Sidney Poitier, with Stephen Boyd and Sammy Davis Jr. And she continues in her most vibrant way to be a force. Our second guest is Jeanne Godoy, who is by training an architect. So for all of you who think that your pieces of paper are tying you to a particular life, for, life path, take a lesson here. He has worked as an architect in Barcelona with many firms there. He's co-founder of the architectural cooperative called Wakapaka. Pacha, an experimental practice for the development of architectural prototypes based on an ancestral Incan civilization because our friend Jian is in fact from Chile. He has done work ranging from installations in American ab on, on, on American Aboriginal cultures to architectural manifestations. His work as a filmmaker investigates the themes of identity and history in pre-Columbian societies of the Americas, and he's particularly interested in how those societies intersect with the African diaspora. In his collaboration with, Est with Esther, they have produced two narratives that investigate the legacies of artists of African-American, Caribbean, and European ancestry. One is called The Story of the Count of Monte Cristo, which is a dramatized documentary which premiered in France and UK and, and Canada, all over the US. It's based on the life of Alexandre Dumas. It was launched in 2007 as a part of the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the end of the slave trade. And, sorry, the end of the slave trade. In collaboration with the British Film Institute's African Odyssey, Jean Godoy and Esther Anderson have produced also the documentary we have come to see this evening, Bob Marley, The Making of a Legend, which is based on the lost footage that Esther shot while working with Bob Marley and the Whalers at 56 Hope Road in Kingston, Jamaica in 1973. The third person who will join us later in the evening, and we're hoping that our Skype will hold up, is Dr. Dave Dunkley. Dr. Dunkley will be joining us by Skype from Jamaica. He is a lecturer in, at the, in the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He has an MA in Heritage Studies and did his PhD at Warwick. He specializes in Caribbean history with a focus on slavery and resistance, freedom, to illuminate the connected historical experiences of the African diaspora in the Atlantic world. His research has produced uh, books and edited volumes in that area, but he has also uh, produced some articles on the early foundations of Rastafari in particular on the life and experiences and philosophies of Leonard P. Howell, who is 
noted by most people to be the very first Rastafarian. So we're hoping that Dave will be able to join us as we get into the discussion. And we're hoping to be joined later on by Chosen from Treasure Isle. And everybody knows Treasure Isle on Eglinton, but I will introduce him properly when he gets here. And we might be joined by Clive as well. Clive Walker, who actually needs little introduction, who is a voice from the a scholar and a voice in the community always talking about reggae, talking about his foundations, talking about how important it is as a record of the social history, not just of Jamaica, but of persons of African descent here in Canada. So join us now. We're going to dim the lights and watch this movie, and then we'll invite our, our um, filmmakers to a Q&A, and after that, we'll expand our panel to the wider panel. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Esther, Gian. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now we'd like to turn directly to a Q&A with the directors of the film. Um, let us be mind, a little mindful of the time, so we'll do some Q&A and then expand it to the larger panel if we can get Dave on, and then we'll see how it goes. But the floor is open, please ask. Esther and Gian, what you would like. There's a mic right there. Yeah. Joe, there's a mic in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I just wondered about is, I guess, Rita and, and the ending. Uh, if you could just talk a bit about, is, is there absence due to, uh, you know, is in some you know, silence around, until then, you mentioned Rita, I guess, and I'm just wondering why it ended there and whether Rita's absent because she's, there's some issue around the film. That's Hold, no, no, before you go, before you go, go. Uh, don't go away. Articulate now, yourself, young man. Uh, where, where, <laughs> the, the question, where does, the, where, where does it come from in your, in your, in your spirit? Okay. What, what are you really concerned about? Oh, I'm not concerned. That's just a question, really. Uh, I'm just interested that... Wait, can you t just uh, explain you it? Okay, like, I'm just yeah. interested in the full story of... You know. Well, I'm sorry. I, that, you know, this film is called Bob Marley Making a Legend. It's not about um, Bob's personal life. You know, it's not really about his personal life. Just because I mentioned a little bit about the personal thing, it's actually, you could say, a page from my own diary. So I, I, I didn't come here to sort of um, okay. expound about him and all his various women and stuff like that. So... No, no, but, but there's something... I have nothing to say. There, there, there is something that is, is interesting, that, that you, you are um, actually addressing um, something to do with the emotional love story within, within the, the musician. Is, would, that, would that be part of the, of the issue? Oh, it's just a matter of interest, really. I, I didn't mean to embarrass you at all. Oh, Sorry. Right. That's okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. No, the work is what I'm here about, you know. Anything else? Hi, Esther and John. Hello. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, my question is in regards to the absence of the Whalers music in your documentary. Can you tell us why this absence to Bob music, only the little section they had with the rehearsal? Rehearsals was the only thing we, we have, yeah. we heard. So can you address maybe why? Uh... Yes. Um, first of all, the songs that I collaborated with Bob on, I wasn't allowed, there's about seven songs. I had about, um, about 18 songs in the, in, in the soundtrack that I wanted to use, which influenced us while we were doing that work. And they were all owned by my ex-partner, Chris Blackwell. Right. And um, then he stopped me from actually using uh, any of the lyrics from the seven songs that I'd worked on. But he tried to blame the Marleys for it, and it wasn't true. 
because I'd been at Rotterdam with Britta and, uh, and, and the boys, and they did their show, and I did my thing, this film was shown, and there was no, nobody said anything to me about anything. And he tried to use them to say that, oh, they want to see the film before he will give me the rights to use the songs. And there was 11 songs, and they had nothing to do with Bali. There were Third World, Burning Spear, you know, all the people who, you know, influence us a lot. And, um, and I realized it was him that was doing it. And then he proved himself by putting lawyers to stop us from, we, uh, we were brought to America to premiere the film at the Tribeca Cinema. And he put um, lawyers on Robert De Niro on the cinema there, and lawyers in England. And so we couldn't use any of the song. We had to take everything off and thank God, you know, the creator is just brilliant because what he did was give a whole new generation a chance to expose their music. So I've got all the children of the whalers. I even had um, Kaimani and Andrew Tosh, but unfortunately they had to withdraw because they were threatened also. They had to withdraw their song um, that went over the rehearsal section, which Chris Blackwell actually took. There were two songs in the rehearsal sequence which the boys are playing, because I asked Bobby to me that song called Nice Time. This time we don't have a long time, we don't have a nice time. And he, that song he's singing and playing, in, and Peter's singing a song uh, about um, Closer Together. Well, when Bob died and Peter died, Chris Blackwell bought the estate of um, Danny Sims, who used to pay Bob, Peter, and Bonnie to write songs for Johnny Nash. And all that back catalog, Chris bought. And in that catalog were those two songs. And then he ended up owning them. And he, even after he'd done this about taking all the other songs away, he then came and did that. And basically, you know, he, he changed Jamaican music culture because we were trying to show out of Jamaica came these uh, amazing kids who didn't have any big education, yet they could, you know, while Linda could say to them, go to C major or whatever, and they could do it. And um, just to, 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 to show the younger generation coming up that if Bob and Peter and all of them could do it, they could do it too. That was the thing, to show the example that they set. And um, so that was, uh, again, lawyers. So, you know, he paid out a lot of money because the first time he didn't win. The second time he win because uh, he, 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 he got what he wanted, which was to um, change um, the whole history of what we did there and then. And, um, but he couldn't stop me. You know, he bought, frankly, these tapes that apparently was found here in Canada. I, I feel that the tapes were uh, left in Hope Road, and that was our office at the time. I was a shareholder of the company and one of the founding directors of the company. And so I had no qualms about leaving the, you know, all our things were left there, um, leaving the, the film behind. We didn't, we, it was just a blueprint. It wasn't the film. It was just, you know, we let the camera run. None of us even knew how to operate that camera because we'd never even seen a video camera before. I had, a, I owned my own 35 Arflex movie camera. I knew how to, to load that up and how to operate, but I certainly never knew what to do with a video camera. Nobody had ever seen it. So, we, we left that, they belonged to Dickie, our friend, and um, then the camera disappeared and those tapes disappeared. And I think that um, they were actually uh, pirated or kidnapped, like uh, my negatives, for years and years, and shelved. Because just about every picture, apart from those two that you see, that's in the, all the advertisements that you see about the film, are the only two shots I have of Bob, yet Chris Blackwell had a movie camera and stills camera when we went around the whole Caribbean islands filming mm. us. The lawyer also had a camera and was shooting us all the time we were on the aeroplane, writing the song, Get Up, Stand Up. The day that Bob died, I called up Abe Summers in Los Angeles and I said, I want the pictures that he took of me and Bob, because the aeroplane dropped in the air when we were flying over Haiti, and both Bob and I were thrown on the ground. And we, but we continued to write the song, which is, was just, you know, and, and Abe Summers was standing over us taking the pictures. And all of those pictures have been shelved, bought up by Chris Blackwell, the guy said, that same day, and shelved. And he's he done that to, with everybody who, 
if he doesn't want you to be credited for anything, you know, you're not going to be. I mean, you know, Manga Records, for example, is not his. It was Danny Cordell. And he started it, and in fact, Danny Cordell found the whalers first. And his story, we have it all on tape, what he has to say. And he was a partner of ours. And he was done in just not only from, from me. So I don't take it personal. <laughs> but you know, that's a sad thing. Yeah, he messed up with something he didn't understand anything about. He never gave us the money to make the proper film we wanted to make of the whalers, you know. Um, he, he accused the, the film director in Hollywood, this man who's very important, given a kind of doctorate of films, Stan Lathan, um, mm -hmm. that he was trying to rip him off, and uh, you know, for a couple of hundred thousand dollars or something, that we could have made a really good film on the whalers from those days. And uh, you know, that's about uh, the New York thing. What happened? That was a charity that brought us there. Um, Paul Bogle's um, great niece, Nikiki Bogle, and she's also Joe Higgs' granddaughter. And um, she has a charity to help children, black children, Caribbean children, who can't get into higher education. And what, that's what our screening, all the money went to that charity. And he tried to stop that. He tried, you know, and he's supposed to be Jamaican. Thank so. you very much for bringing this to us. Thank you. Canada and worldwide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> right, so I just have a quick question. Um, based on the, the wealth of information from this documentary, um, you know, I'm guessing the Bob Marley story and the Whaler story could be drama, adventure, romance, exactly. maybe even sci-fi, all wrapped up have a <laughs> into one. If, if you got the chance, if, if let's say, you know, in, in, in your wildest dreams, if you ever got the chance to make a documentary without any of the legal um, red tape, what kind of documentary would it be? Would, what what, what it's story is it? a great celebration of, of, of really, really go deep into the thing. We had no budget. You know, we, did, we made this documentary with our own finance and, and our friends and Facebook friends. This documentary has been over... 40 film festivals invited, won awards, etc., And we've not been able to go to all of them because so we have a whole team of people around the world who helps us, who goes and represents us at festivals, who speak on our behalf. We have Jamie Mello right here. He was 14 years old. He's a Canadian young man, and his parents are here. And he was 14 years old when he came on board and did the website for Trenhorn Films for this movie. From the very, very beginning, he was right there with us at the beginning. And he's 16, he's going to be 17 years old. Yeah. So is there, is there footage still out there that is yet to be unearthed? Well, I certainly have not been giving him back all my footage, but I'm so <laughs> grateful that what we got back, we've been able to fashion a film to at least show you a little bit of what motivated them and what, where their music actually, you know, Marcus Gavia and Stelassi had a big impact on them yeah. and Jamaican politics. Yes. And the Bible, of course. All right, thank you very much. Yes, hi, good evening. Good evening. Yes, my name is Keo. I'm from the School of Social Work. Yes. So I just passed class and saw this, you know, and I had to take it. And, and, and it was such a great opportunity to see this. And um, just listening to um, some of the information coming out of the, the, the documentary. Is it a documentary or is yes. it? Yeah, a documentary. Um, we call it a musical documentary. A musical documentary. Yeah, I, I see where a lot of um, um, information is passed about unity and love and, you know, supporting one another and how to move, move forward, you know, in solidarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And reflecting on, on coming together, you know, and looking with a critical eye, looking on the segregation caused by, um, you know, slave owners and stuff, yes. and, you know, and the white man, uh, and to see a, a white woman having an influence in helping, you know, um, the people move forward. I really appreciate that, and I love the unity, you know, that come out of that and stuff. And this wealth of information, just seeing Bob Marley in a different light, you know, knowing a little bit more about him, and re I realize how human he is, you know, and how a regular guy he is, you know, and I really, really appreciate this video. And I just want to say thank you for sharing this, you know, and thank I hope you. more come out too. 
Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, I am um, one. I'm not really a white woman. <laughs> woman of but you know, I, I, we're human. I'm a Jamaican, and we're yeah. all mixed out there. Yes, okay? There's yes. no such thing as any white or no black out there. We are just Jamaicans. There's no Chinese Jamaicans, no yes. Indian Jamaicans, and we're Jamaicans. Period. Yes. Um, well. There's more to come. Hopefully, one day, you know, some of the there's lots of footage, for example, of Bob out at Helsha at the hammock and all of that, and also in Hope Road because we had hammocks there and it was always underneath that mango tree. You know, the mango tree, as they say, it was his office. Um, that's where he had most of his meetings, and you know, and of course, many uh, stuff of Bongo Maki with the, with the drums and the chalice and uh, in the back of where the rehearsal room is, that's where they all smoked and, you know, the rituals that went on the whole time. And that was all recorded because I had somebody with me all the time who, uh, you know, I told him, shoot that, shoot this, shoot that, you know. And so we were, we were um, documenting everything, but unfortunately, you know, somebody's got them. It probably is my ex-partner. <laughs> mm. I wouldn't think anything about that. Yeah, and I, I apologize for calling you white, you know, because... <laughs> um, but apparently, excuse me, apparently in Africa, if you went to Africa, especially Ghana, doesn't matter who you are. If you come from abroad, you're considered white. And I said, even Peter Tasha, Bob Marley? And they said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I find that quite amazing. Yeah. So, you know, and, 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 and apparently, because there's a little kid there that I have adopted and I sort of help out my little Ben and he's got problems and whatever. Yeah. And uh, they took the picture of me to show to the family and they said, I, I, absolutely, I'm a white woman. And then my friend said to them, no, she wouldn't like that, you know, because she's, her granny was an African woman and, uh, and so on. So and uh, and they said, well, they don't believe him because yeah. I am a white woman. <laughs> yeah, it's just the privilege of this, the skin color, you know, like big a big difference in in the community back then. Yes, you know? uh, yes, and I think stuff, that so. um, the privileges that go with the color of your skin they still exist in Jamaica. It, it does. Very big. That's why my ex partner, he still is like the king of Jamaica. Right. No care what he does, he'll still be the king of Jamaica. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Yeah. I, I just wonder if I could ask a, a, a two-part question, or in fact, it's two separate questions. But firstly, I was just curious, you mentioned the film wraps up quite quickly with you departing, and I just wonder if, you had, if that was the end of any contact you had with Bob before he passed. No. And secondly, a, a, a very different question is, um, as a person, strangely enough, dare I say, some of this footage, as, as somebody who collects things, I had, oh, and I wondered if, I, I, given, I, given you said it appeared in Toronto, I wonder if you could actually say anything more about where the, where the material was actually recovered from. Cause, I wish I could. Because <laughs> I know there's some hours of that stuff that's been kind of in some circulation for some time. Yeah, well, you know, if you can track it down, you know, I would be really appreciated. But I have no idea which garage we're in Canada. Um, in fact, that man, uh, he did the one documentary, I think it's called Rebel Music. Rebel Music, the, doc, the guy who made the documentary, um, I allowed him to use some of the footage, but you know, they always do use it in a, in, not telling the truth, they're, they're using it to say, oh, he was doing it there, and the camera wasn't even invented then, and all those kind of things. So um, I decided to stop uh, letting people have it, but it was already, as I said, was stolen and pirated for 40, through this man who came to interview me for the rebel music uh, from the uh, Channel 4 in, in London. And, um, you know, who knows how many copies that exist about the so-called collectors. <laughs> Jamie probably have an idea, you know. So, but you know, they can't really, I'm not meant to do anything, it's registered to me in the Library of Congress, and um, if there's any, any sort of thing, truth in the so-called copyright law. They're not meant to do it. But you know, Chris Blackwell's lot, did, um, what's his name? Um, the director of the, picture, the Marley movie, he did. He, he came to my house, I said, no, we're making our own film. And he still went and used my pictures and my footage without my permission to, to, for me to start court cases. And then, of course, my work had fallen in the wayside. 
So I just ignored it. I said, well, it's been pirated for 30, 40 years. What, the, what difference does it make now? They can't tell the story that I can tell because it's my footage and I know what they say and I know what we were doing, right? So um, I really, I mean, to me, that's an, another story. So I would just find out we're in Canada because we have never seen that, that man again, the man who brought it back to me. That company, he sold it, and I think they, they owe us money and stuff because um, the, the time, you know, you give a license for them to use the footage for so long, and then they have to um, pay you again and stuff, and they've disappeared. <laughs> they always do. No, what, what, what the film, well the, well, the footage appeared a few times, and Esther always mentioned that that was the footage, and, you know, she had narrated several things, footage that has not reappeared. but. When you see those b b few bits and pieces here and there, apart from the Peter Tosh documentary, on, which is called The X Tapes, yes, where it appears there too, yeah. you, you see that, that the footage is used to tell other stories. Yeah, they, 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 they associate themselves to a colonial view in which it's just musical entertainment yeah. and sort of like some excitement about it and in between would come the BBC or Channel 4 or some um, broadcaster who is associated to colonial views and they would tell their stories and prevent, which, which is, I think that is, uh, is, the, is the really unpleasant side of it, that, that they would prevent by dominating the market, would prevent the Jamaicans or the Caribbean people telling their own, st their own stories. And yeah. that is where it hurts. Because then what, what you maintain over centuries is that you maintain a narrative that is always told from the metropolis, from the white people, the Europeans, the Northern Europeans, now the Americans and the Canadians. They tell the story as much as they dig the, the soil to actually extract the mining. And so there's never really the understanding that uh, why don't we just uh, tell our stories and let other people tell um, um, their stories. And the footage is very symbolic. To, to that, and it's even more symbolic of how how um, very present the control of colonial power is today in Caribbean culture, is that the film in 2014 um, suffers uh, what, what you call uh, what, what happens in totalitarian regimes, which is uh, you cannot tell the story of Jamaica, which is a very humble and small island. You can't tell the story of Jamaican history because Jamaica does not belong to the Jamaican, to the musician, not even to the history, it belongs to shareholders. <laughs> so, that, so, that, so that it becomes always um, uh, sort of like an, a, a chained um, uh, identity. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and so that the, so that the footage is very, is very interesting because the appearance and disappearance of the footage, the, 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 the having to eliminate the original sound, all those things are very telling of the kind of mechanisms that exist today, not okay. during the 60s, today, about how you silence other cultures so that your culture uh, continues of, uh, you, know, um, you know, growing and expanding and um, you can never really have enough of that. And so from that point of view, the footage is very interesting. And so it is a footage that speaks for freedom, but it doesn't really because you can't actually, uh, you know, mm. Esther, you know, I mean, you know, 40 years from the moment that you conceive the idea of actually telling the story about the whalers until you are able to actually tell the story and you're not even able to tell it because the very people who actually have the control over the island 40 years ago, they still control it and make it very difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the, the, the lost footage is a key element to understanding the forces that play today in regards to identity and culture in the Caribbean mm -hmm. and Latin America. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, a question. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. I had a midterm, otherwise I would have been here right at the beginning. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I do have a question, and I just wanted to know, do you have any regrets? You know, I know we shouldn't necessarily dwell on the negative, but maybe okay. we can learn from some of the things that you wish that you could have changed. Um, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on the relationship and trying to like make it like Maury Povich, the drama. I know it's not only about that. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. That's okay. 
Yeah, I know it's more about the work that was done, but whether the, whether it's the relationship section or anything, I just wanted to find out if you had any regrets and um, what those would be. Thank you. Um, if I have any regrets, is that Bob is not with us today. And I feel that um, if he was with us, he probably would be a very wise, wise old Rasta man, you know, with his white hair and everything, because everybody of his age now all have white, white beards and white hair. But I feel that with the amount of the wealth that he accumulated in that short time, it should it could have been used to help secure his health better or look after him better. I don't know, you know, I left and um, I didn't see him for about a year and a half. And then when I did see him again, it's when he came back from Zimbabwe after the independence celebration. And um, I then, and we danced all night. I can't believe that he had anything wrong with his toe. And they say, you know, his toe, that he had cancer and all of this. I just, and um, a year later he, was, he had passed. But I just think he did look so tired in his face and really aged a lot. And I just thought, gosh, it's not like he's overworked, you know, they've, they've overworked him. And um, a few people have written about it since, that in fact, and that he had voiced that opinion, that why it is that they've sent him on the road again when they knew that he was so ill. And you know, it was quite a, easy for my, my ex-partner to, um, you know, any artist, he's got lots of artists that is all finished off, and then he ends up with the, the copyright to all their songs. And it's fine to turn somebody killer off and then turn you into a cult and a myth. And then, uh, you know, he, he's all the way to the bank. You know, Bob's not even buried. You know, we, at one point we thought that he'd be actually up there at uh, Bob's mem uh, mausoleum, pushing a button for the tourists. You know, it became like that. And so those are the regrets. I find that it's um, what we what we tried to do in Jamaica at that time. Um, if you, you you see that little piece of footage of me talking about trying to make the film about him in '73 on Jamaican television. You know. We were, it was a very pure thing. We were all, you know, really believed in something that we were going to, I feel that Jamaica is, Jamaica is a spiritual island. We came out of 400 years of, had a brainwashing with every kind of religion you can imagine on us, except maybe Buddhism. <laughs> um, and, and out of that, you know, something spiritual has to come out of it. If you come to know yourself as God or whatever, you have to, you know, handle this and deal with it. And I felt that we were, Jamaica was um, like gossamer's wings. You know, at that time in the 70s, the energy was so amazing. And it wasn't just the whalers. It was all the musicians on the island. It was just bubbling and just waiting for this opportunity to just go through. And then you're like, once Bob was, because I know that, you know, White people like their own people, and they love the idea that Bob had a white father. And once we could give those journalists that hook, they were there, just like, you know, the John Crow them come. <laughs> you know what I mean? They came, there was not one black journalist, not one, during the entire time of launching his career. Um, and they came, and they got their story, and they went, and they built their thing, and they built their thing. And when he died, they kept building it, but in a different way, just to actually create the myth and the thing that um, he has become, turn him into a commodity, and, and, and control the name of Mali as the only outlet for reggae music, you know, because reggae music is not just from the whalers or from Bob Marley, not even the whalers that even get mentioned. It's not just Bob Marley that's brought you this music. It's J Jamaican music is going back from the times of, you know, African people coming as slaves. If you look at all the old paintings and all the, the, the research, the books, you will see the African people, they dressed up, of course, like uh, English, uh, you know, in their jodhpurs and whatever, playing the violin, playing all the different instruments at, at King's house 
house and whatever. So music is a part of the culture of that country. We, we grew up with it. Everybody's singing all our lives. And whether we went to church or not, church is a big thing in our lives. And um, West African music, which is, uh, we call it Pokomania, but it's Maya re religion brought in there. And all of that you know, wrapped up together with Christianity and everything else. Um, you know, I just felt that all of you, even Peter, who is so um, revolutionary, in it, yet he talked about the church and how much the church, the, the church affected him. And he was against uh, so many things. And yet his mother was the most dearest, sweetest uh, Christian of a woman. She never changed to become a dreadlocks woman. She was what she was, a very spiritual, sweet, and gentle woman. Um, and so those are just some of the things that we were trying to get out, uh, trying to get across to the world that, um, you know, we had something to say and we did have a voice. And, um, but, you know, everybody gets silenced. I mean, here in America, everywhere they get silenced, you know. And of course, we are in a great place to Harriet Tubman, who one of my fantastic um, role models of perseverance and, you know, sticking to itness. And uh, all the things that she did, you know, to, to help the people from the South. And, uh... Greetings and good night. Thank you so much no for a lovely that. production. Um, I have a question that is centered around spirituality. You spoke in the film about the, the, the influence of Rasta, and I would like to know if this film has any resident resonance around the current struggles of Rastafari, Pinnacle being the most present and urgent, and I'm just wondering if there is any resonance in this film to carry that continued message. Thank you. Well, we, you know, we, we are aware of what's going on in Pinnacle. Um, I think when my first my first uh, message to them was, why don't, we, why don't you all go to, go to Shashamani? Because there is land in Ethiopia. And they could all just pick up and say, OK, we live in Jamaica. If they're not Jamaican, then they believe in the, 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 the spirit of Rastafari and Ethiopia, then go to Shashamani. Demand reparation from the government and leave and go and fix, start a new life, just like people come here and start a new life. However, that the people have lived on that land for so many uh, generations. Um, I find it quite extraordinary that the Jamaican government, and I know Portia Simpson, would actually take that uh, thing and, and they want to go and capitalize on the Rastafarian movement, but uh, to throw the people off of the land to then build their own kind of whatever it is that they want to do. Or maybe they just want to make very expensive housing. Who knows? But. Um, Rastafarians in Jamaica is almost like, I talk about the Coney in the film, because when we went to Jamaica to reshoot, um, you know, revisit places that we had actually done some of the work, including with Countryman, we went on this thing about the Coney. We used the Coney as a metaphor for what has happened to the Rastafarian movement. And to us, the actual Rastafarians had gone underground. Just because you see the people with the dreadlocks didn't mean that they were Rastafarians. They didn't feel or believe in the same spirit of what we found there in the 1970s, 71, 72. Even Michael Manley used Rastas to win the first, um, the first, uh, election. yeah, the first election, and. Um, and Marty McBlana, all these people, they, they all use it because they knew that it was a very powerful um, thing that people could have uh, somebody like Selassie to look to, uh, you know, because we come from a little colony. Jamaica is like a little kingdom. Everybody's a king or a queen or a duchess or whatever. It's, to me, it's a colonial thing that, you know, is a thing. But the idea that you could actually associate yourself to a man like Selassie who was a black man in Africa, who was so spiritually so evolved and um, and very righteous person, then uh, it was a great, great, great thing. It's like giving them a, a role model. And um, 
I don't know what's going to happen with Pinnacle. People are, uh, we are all, you know, everybody's trying to tell them that it's not the right thing to do to trouble these people and leave them alone. They're not creating any havoc. But, you know, they've done worse things to Rastas in Jamaica. So, you know, maybe we're a little bit, um, a little bit used to what they get, you know, they do. Like, for example, what John Marcus talks about the economics of um, the music, for example, are coming out of Jamaica. The, the, the areas in Jamaica where the music comes from doesn't benefit from it. You know, Chris Blackwell benefits from it. Not even the Jamaican government, because the money is outside of Jamaica. It's in tax-free havens, you know, and... Um, whether you have hotels and call them Bob Marley hotels, that money is paid with credit cards. It goes outside of uh, Jamaica. So uh, economically, unless somebody is there to actually stand up for the Rastafarians, nothing is going to happen good for them because uh, they don't have a, have a voice and it's not uh, strong enough as a body of people. Outside of Jamaica, yes. But inside of Jamaica, I didn't find yeah. that um, just there's any hope. Just before our next question, I just wanted to bring people up to date a little bit on the Pinnacle. Yeah. Uh, ah, and just a little bit of background. Pinnacle is a, um, an area near to Spanish Town in St. Catherine, where the first Rastafarian community, one of, well, the first Rastafarian, Howell, the first Rastafarian, and his community started there. And they have been there since the 30s, the 40s, they have been there a really long time. But in typical uh, colonial way, they never did get title of this land. And recently, a developer got hold of the land. Now, there should have, the government, one of the governments, for well, you know, we have plenty, uh, had promised to buy the land on behalf of the community and did not do so. So a developer got hold of the land and is now threatening to well, not threatening, has ish, had gotten lawyers to give them yeah. eviction notices to leave this land. Yeah. So it, it is one hell and powder house in Jamaica because uh, everybody knows that this is where Rasta started. So they have filed injunctions. It is going through the court system very slowly. But they, oh, the Rastafarian wait. community is in a dilemma because oh, on the wait. one hand, they see it as part of the island's patrimony and that it should be bought by the government on behalf of the Jamaican people for posterity. But who are you going to buy it from? The thing uh, is... It, precisely. Well, on the other hand, some in the Rasta community believe that they should get their own money together and form a corporation and buy it for Rasta. So they are at loggerheads even within the community as to exactly what to do. In the meantime, UNESCO is saying this is world patrimony. So it is the, in the usual Jamaican mix-up, mix-up, uh, but we are hoping that they will not get evicted. They have declared where Howell actually lived, the developer has decided to give back. But the other five lots are still in contest, you know, being contested. So it is in the courts and it is a mess. But isn't there a law which we, we, we did, because for 30 odd years also I didn't have the title for that house above and we, we, the land we bought and the house we built. I didn't have any title, I just left it go, but he finally got the title for me because after 12 years of occupying the, the, the place, it's yours. You can legally um, get your, your titles. So I can't understand these people have been there for so long. Why it is that the government would want to fool them that, that maybe they're not even aware that... Um, well, I mean, if... Um, if I think that it's a sign of the, 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 the weakness of the political system today to represent society and how they, throughout the world, what, what the politicians are representing is big business. They, 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 are, they are tied up because they can't operate without the money, I mean, as they say, so they follow the business operation. And if, despite the laws, the government um, is inclined to evict the Rastas from uh, Pinnacle, they can do it. I mean, but but it would be. I mean, I don't. I don't think that they can get away with it. I think. I think that you know they're playing with um, actual fire, and uh, and uh, you know if they're testing the fire, they're going to get burned. Well, I think they have to bring the media down on, on, onto the Jamaican government because if the government can do, turn around and do that when they know that the law is to say if 12 years of occupancy, you can you can apply for a title, because that is how I got my title. Um, I just uh, I don't see I don't see what's holding what what's what's holding on what right. It's just that because the people are ignorant and probably don't know what their rights is. Yeah, 
Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say something about Pinnacle, just to put it in, a, in, in, in some more context. Yes. So um, the, the government destroyed Pinnacle twice, once in the 1940s and once in the 50s. Right? So I think we, we have to say that. So, you know, because we make it sound as if it was there going on since the 30s, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And I mean, look, it's, it was a commune. So yeah. it's not a community. Yeah. It was a okay. commune. And it wasn't just herb that they, that they grew at, at uh, Pinnacle, which is typically what some of the sort of fast food journalists will say. Yes. Uh, they, they grew s different crops. It was yeah, a yeah. full-fledged commune. Yeah. Sort of, I guess the closest thing that you could think of is like the hippie communes in, in California in the 60s, right? It's probably the, the closest thing to what, what you'd understand. Yeah. So it's a full-fledged commune where, and, and you know, there was education there for the kids. And, I mean, there's lots of academic work that's been done on it um, in terms of studying what happened at Pinnacle, in terms of the vibrancy of the community, how independent it was, <laughs> And you know, it was really a beacon for Rastafari during that time. Now, the second time when, when the government destroyed Pinnacle, it was the military that moved in, not just police, police and military, right? And so Rasta scattered and moved to a place called Bakawal, which is now Tivoli, right? Um, so they went to this ghetto. They were moved into, into, which is in the heart of Kingston, in West Kingston, in the ghetto, right? Um, into two ghettos, one called Akiwak, one called um, Bakawal, mm -hmm. right? And um, by the time I arrived in, in Jamaica in 1965, a year after that, in 1966, they took bulldozers and bulldozed down the whole of Akiwak and the whole of, of, of Bakawal yes. to build Tivoli Gardens yes, right. because the GLP was in power and they needed to yes. remove, they just yeah. physically just wipe out people and remove them, like furniture, everything, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, this is the history of Rasta in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. This is what Rasta was like in the 1960s in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You know, we're glorifying it now, everything was, you know, mm -hmm. for my generation as a youth growing up at that time, that was the kind of thing that we, we looked towards. I mean, well, that was a time of black power, you know, quasi Rasta or Rasta that, you know, but in terms of the general society, middle class society, the same attitude they have towards dancehall music is the same attitude they have towards Rasta during that time. So I just wanted to put that in context, that you know, this happening now is it, it's not even as, I mean, I, I'm trying to compare, right, the, yeah. the destruction that went on during that time to yeah. what's happening now. We were talking about court cases. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Uh, thank you, Clive, our, thank you, Clive, our resident historian of the matter. Um, you know, I, and we're going to get to your question, believe me. <laughs> Um, part of what this documentary highlights, right, is the vulgar commodification of Rasta and the vulgar commodification of reggae revolutionary music. Because what we're seeing here, when, when Bob and Peter are in that exchange and they're struggling through some philosophical questions, right, struggling through what is God, who is God, where is God, uh, how do I handle this thing about, how, how do I walk through this life as an oppressed person in a place, in a, in a neo-colonial or could I take off the neo-colonial um, place like Jamaica and make my way forward. And we've never been able in that island, despite the outside view of Jamaica as being this place of blackness and blah, 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 we know inside that it mash up, mash up, and that there are ways in which we have not been able to have these conversations because the ruling classes are so busy sweeping things under the rug and holding on to land and pushing people off land and bulldozing down people that we spend so much time just running and scattering and trying to survive that that philosophical moment of understanding who we are gets lost in the shuffle of survival. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a lot of this for me is really important to listen to. So um, my contributions in terms of a question are not coming from a racial discourse uh, perspective because like, I'm a student myself and all of this is education for me. But what I am informed in is an artistic perspective. Um, I'm a photographer myself. I look towards history, obviously, as like my route to find out, you know, where my place is. Um, as a West Indian creator and filmmaker, who were you looking towards as um, your motivation or your, you know, inspiration to, you know, continue what you're doing right now? Because I would love to have the longevity that you have yourself now. So, um, 
That's my question. Well, you know, I, I I loved filmmaking from the very beginning, from the very start. I, and I became an actress just to be able to get, get um, behind the cameras. But it's not easy for a woman to be a filmmaker because um, it's, it definitely is a man's world and it's not easy to get funding and distribution. You might be able to make your film, but then you just, it might just end up in, in the cans on the shelf. Um, who I look to, we, we both um, are very keen on uh, European cinema. And, and, and of course, some of the cinema that's come out of South America and some of it's from Africa. We, we, we like films that deal with issues and, uh, and, and are great stories, you know, and, and we like filmmakers who are great storytellers. Um, one of the old ones uh, for me is a French director called Marcel Carney. And um, he did epic films, you know. He, he shows you French life in the most extraordinary way, from the lowest, the middle, to the highest. Within the society, he can bring it all together in one. And uh, that's my problem, you know. I try, I try to make short films, I try to do that, but I, it just become epic because I'm so conditioned by, by, by people like him. And... Um, there was a, a, a female a filmmaker that I liked very much also. She was influenced by the French school also, as you saw Palsy. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't hear anything more about her, her work. But she did win an Oscar for Marlon Brando in the dry white season, if you saw that film. It's about South Africa um, during the times of apartheid. Um, I don't know about Jan. Well, if you're a photographer, uh, it would it would be worth the while mentioning would it be worth the while mentioning some some of the uh, some of the friends that uh, grew up with Esther in London in the 60s and later on in the 70s in the states um you know uh, the, the photographer of the beatles like uh, bob freeman so you know you've got a way of looking at things the 60s in london has an entire aesthetics about things you know they have an understanding of light that is very particular the way that they want to communicate an image or a concept they do it in a particular 60s way mm -hmm. um, the, you know our experience um, working with 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 the english boys and girls there in 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 london is that they're very thorough in the way that they approach um, um, doing any work they're kind of rather to the point and um, um, concentrated. So you don't have to really go into big discussions about when it's going to be done or anything. They just think about it, they look at it technically, they find a solution and they just pass it on and next thing, right? So it's very, very, um, it's a good school. And, I, and, and, and the experience uh, that, that I understood Esther went through is a very, it's a very 60s, Photography associated to communicating this liberating moment, which mm -hmm. was a moment of you know uh, changing then? the world, changing the the greatness of yes. England, and um, um, and and then and then you know the you, you've got the, the photographer of Bob Dylan's um, um, Jerry Schatzberg, um, Jerry Schatzberg, who mm -hmm. also has a particular American. approach to photography and okay. and to music and to documenting. You see, the, and he became a filmmaker too. There is, there is something about um, Esther's work as an artist is that she has uh, an approach to uh, being almost like a photojournalist. Yes. Is that Sorry. the camera is in your face, yes. meaning that she, get, she might get shot, but she will be there. And she's not going to ask for permission. She's going to be there. And I think that... Um, um, that, that is a particular, you, know, you would say, it's a particular I strand of um, being a photographer and then appreciating the light. Yes. You see. Now, in regards to your 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 introduction, is that I come from Chile and I emerged from a social movement that took place in the seventies that emerged from a long colonial um, struggle. Uh, you know, not not very. I mean, not entirely different from Jamaica, um, and so that as an artist, as a filmmaker, even as an architect. You know, one thinks that is this building going to make a social contribution to awareness about life and how we live in life or not? Or is it going to just be a financial instrument for mm. one's mortgage or for somebody's pension plan, mm. you see? And so I look at it from that point of view in regards to the, the photography and the art, you see? So 
who, who who is going to be represented and what reality is going to be invented or represented in here and what contribution is going to make you see and 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 and, and that you know I mean, that that makes a bit of a difference mm -hmm. because otherwise you know you just get straight into the the, the fashion of um, you know the art and the art world is run by um, you know more, more or less business you know, um, Western Western point of view, which is perfectly all right, but you know it's just a bit too wide, and so. What is beautiful in yeah. the West? Many photographers, anyway. I love photography. I usually, we, when we were living in Paris, I was at the Paris Photo Week every, and I've seen the pictures a hundred times, but you still want to see them. <laughs> For example, the footage, the black and white footage seen by, by the British, sort of like BBC people and um, you know, documentary makers and things like that, you know, people who are actually are experts on um, moving images. They, they, had, they had not conceived the possibility of the footage being um, uh, projected on cinema and seen as a very particular kind of um, story or a particular kind of grain. And um, I think that the, the process of making it um, that that way is I think that we're very influenced by 1920s filmmaking. Yes. Nine, you know anything before the Second War. You know even you know even you can push it up to 1932, 1933. But you know there is a whole period of just you know great vitality and just creativity and passion in the way that you were developing the language through the black and white right. and then this even you know in silent movies. Yes. The the creativity, the lighting. The, the, you know the storytelling. It just uh, you, know, you know. I think that is to me the, some of some of the most you know extraordinary extraordinary material. And then fr from those from those eyes, you can see the the exchange with Peter and Bob and and Esther there in Hope Road as really very you know very historical. Yeah, they, they, we footage. we try not to touch the footage at all because first of all. The image were supposed to have dis been uh, completely dead. Uh, when they found it, it was so corroded or something, they, they had to bake it to bring the image back. It's like probably a resurrection <laughs> of all of them, really. Um, and then we tried to clean it up. But in fact, it was the British Film Institute people who did the first cleaning, and then Tony Curran in Soho did the second cleaning. And it still is the way it is. So, but we're so nervous to touch it because we, it, you know it might just fall apart. And so it's just like I remember when after I cut off my locks and I came out, I went to the Library of Congress and I started to read, really read a lot. And one of the books I was allowed to read was I had to go in a glass cage and uh, and there was a guard standing there with a gun, <laughs> and I had to wear my gloves and uh, and I go in there and it was the diary of the son of Columbus, who had been in Jamaica when they were shipwrecked for a year and a week in 1502 or something. And uh, it was his diary. He had kept a diary. And you touch the thing, you know, you're afraid to actually move the page over because it would just crumble in your hand. And they warned me about all of that. And I was just so nervous. What with the guard standing there and everything, you know? And I was just new to this kind of thing. So I felt, in a way, our footage was a bit like that. And, and he did, too, because I would have probably chopped into it a little bit more, you know. But um, John Marcos wouldn't let us touch it. <laughs> anyway, my, my one, only one thing to you as a photographer, growing photographer, get everything you can get to read up about lighting. Lighting a, a subject. Because in the end, photography for me is photographing the light. Whatever is in the light. So the subject in the light is, uh, that's where it's at. And of course, if you're a photojournalist, then you can really go and grab shots from here and grab shots from there. And if you catch it with the light at the same time, a bit like Baba Natspliff, it's a winner. OK. All right, I think we can. Uh, bring the evening to a close and thank Esther and Jian once more for their contribution. Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to, to let you know that the DVD and the CDs are on sale. 
and I urge you to contribute if you can, please purchase because, and I'll talk about the books in a minute, um, because they are doing this on their own. They have no, they don't have no big bucket team. Oh, there is no Hollywood, there is no Nollywood, no Bollywood. So please um, do what you can to support this. And there are some glorious books at the back about Jamaica, putting things in a larger context. And I urge you to look at those as well to see uh, if you would like to, to purchase. Um, in, in echo of last year, 2013 was the first time when Performing Diaspora did two events. And we did a film screening such as this, and then later in the year, we did an event about hip hop, which was an amazing international, wonderful success, uh, led by our own Francesca here. And I would like to um, make a, the beginnings of a commitment to do something bigger on Rasta later this year, uh, perhaps around the same time, around June, because we need another moment of ventilation. And just like with the the hip hop conference to do panels around certain subjects. So Rasta as 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 aesthetic, Rasta as as religious, um, culture, Rasta as um, everything. You know the music, the everything, and to to spread it out and to spend a day just talking about this thing, which is so important. Certainly not just to Jamaica, but right now not just to the Caribbean, but actually to the world. And to to just spend a moment talking about this in, in a serious way, not in any kind of you know, passing way, but a serious way, all right? So we will get that together as best as we can, and we will let you know. So those who didn't hear before, we need to put you on our list, sir. Please don't leave without putting your email in our, in our list, sir, uh, because we have events such as this from time to time, and the, the Tubman Institute is very proud of these things that we do in this place called Canada. Okay, thank you so much for coming, and I look forward to seeing you later in the year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much oh, for coming out. Oh, this oh last thing, sorry. Yeah. I got a message from Dave. Uh, Dunkley, our Jamaican connection, the <laughs> it was unstable as you saw, up and down. So yeah, he exactly. said, please apologize, and he will be here in June. He, he made that commitment. Okay, thanks. <laughs>